Hey guys, today I'm going to be telling you about specific heat capacity. So this is still GCSE revision. So let's start with an exercise. So uh, I imagine that you're sitting down maybe in a classroom or maybe in your home. Try at the same time to touch with a piece of metal with one hand and a piece of wood with another hand, okay? So for example, here I have, you know, imagine that you are in a classroom, you have the tables, uh, legs and the top of the table, one is wood and the other one is made of metal. Now think about it, your hands, they should be at the same temperature, right? Your body should be all more or less at the same temperature. So which material feels warmer to you, the metal or the wood? And then try to explain this, and you can freeze the board by now, uh, freeze the video by now, I mean, by using the words conductor and insulator in your answers, okay? Now, moving on on the question, on the answer. You probably felt that the metal was cold and that the wood was feeling warmer. This is because metals are good conductors, so they will conduct the heat away from your hands and that's why your hands are feeling colder when you touch the metal than when you touch the wood. The wood is not a good conductor and it does not conduct the heat away from your hands as well as the metal, so the wood will feel warmer than the metal. Again, this making that is all the same circumstances is only the type of material that is changing, okay? So if you think about it, different substances will heat up differently even though the same heat is being applied to them at the exact same time, applying it the same weight, all of these things. Again, just think about the example you just did with the hands touching the metal and touching the woods at the same time. So, when you hit a substance, the temperature rise on that substance is going to depend on several things. It's going to depend on the amount of energy that you're supplying to that substance. It's going to depend on the amount of mass of the substance. And it's going to depend on what the substance is made of. So, the more energy you give to something, then the temperature is going to rise faster or higher, more. The bigger the mass, the more energy you need to increase the temperature. And what the substance is made of is what it comes into the specific heat capacity. So the specific heat capacity, by definition, is the energy that is needed or that is being transferred to a mass of one kilogram of that substance to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius. So, the specific heat capacity has this, the, the symbol for C, this small C that you see in here, and it's going to tell you how much energy you need to get one kilogram of that substance to increase the temperature by one degree. And the units for specific heat capacity, which you need to know well, are joules divided by kilogram times degrees Celsius. Now, a question or something that people normally get wrong in exams when they get something wrong about specific heat capacity is if you're doing the calculations for specific heat capacity, not being careful that kilograms and degrees Celsius need both to be divided in joules, and you guys just put joules over kilograms times degrees Celsius, and then suddenly you are doing the calculation of joules divided by kilograms and then timing the whole thing by degrees Celsius, okay? So that will give you the wrong answer, be careful. So, just by looking the, at the units, we can figure out the formula for specific heat capacity. Joules are the units for energy, kilograms are the units for mass, and degrees Celsius are the units for temperature. So, the formula for specific heat capacity is energy transferred, that comes in joules, all dividing by mass, which comes in kilograms, that is multiplying the temperature change. And here you put temperature and not temperature change because specific heat capacity is to do on how much energy you need to raise a certain temperature, okay, for a certain mass. So again, as I was saying, people sometimes are doing calculations in exams of specific heat capacity. And what they do is they don't put brackets in here, so they instead of doing energy transfer divided by mass that multiplies the temperature change, they do energy transfer divided by mass, and without being careful with anything else, they then times everything 
so the times comes outside really by the temperature change so be careful as you're doing this in a calculator don't input the value straight on make sure that you're being careful that you're obeying the formula okay so in a calculator you need to put brackets in here so both of these things multiplied before being divided by the energy transfer okay or before dividing the energy transferred so again specific in capacity the energy that you need to tr or that you need to transfer to one kilogram of the substance to raise the temperature by one degree this is two ways that you see the same formula sometimes they say that the energy is going to be the mass times the specific heat capacity times so again mass times specific heat capacity times and then you can have a theta or a delta t and they both mean the same okay so E is for energy transferred in joules most of the times the formulas show like this not as the C equals E over M times temperature change M stands for mass in kilograms C stands for specific heat capacity which has the units of joules over kilogram times degree Celsius and then the theta or the delta T are going to stand for temperature change in degree Celsius if you happen to be doing this in Kelvin you can do the temperature change in Kelvin as well because one difference of one degree Celsius does correspond to the same difference of the uh, degrees in terms of Kelvin so one difference in degree Celsius equals to the difference of one Kelvin we don't say degrees for Kelvin um, so that's how you can calculate the specific heat capacity using that formula and let's just try some exercises I took away the red exercises which was just recollection and let's apply this so let's go to a medium type of exercise they say 72,200 joules of energy has been given to an aluminium block that has a mass of one kilogram the block has a starting temperature of 14 degrees and the temperature went up to 22 degrees find the specific heat capacity of aluminium second question says how much energy is needed to heat five kilograms of water from 20 to 60 degrees celsius and they give you the specific heat capacity of water which is 4200 joules per kilogram per degree celsius so freeze the board uh, not freeze the board <laughs> uh, freeze the video pause the video try them and then here are the answers coming up oh no the exercises i'll show you these ones after so amber questions so first specific heat capacity change the formula to show how you do it to get specific heat capacity that can give you a mark straight away depending on the total number of marks of the exercise so is energy over mass times the temperature change normally you get a mark by substituting the values 7200 divided by one kilogram that is multiplying 22 minus 14 which will be the temperature change you get normally a mark by getting the right answer number 900 and another mark by getting the units which is joules divided by kilogram times degrees celsius second question for the specific heat capacity of water or the energy that you needed sorry for to heat up the water the mass of water was five so you do five times the specific heat capacity 4200 times the temperature change 60 minus 20 so this will give you 840,000 joules which you can say as 840 joules again always write the working that you're doing in questions write the formula substitute the values that alone gives you marks get the answer get the units right careful with the number of significant figures in case you need to get a certain number okay sometimes that comes on the exams or is coming lately and now an extension exercise a little bit more difficult they say a three kilowatt electric kettle is being used to bring 1.5 kilograms of water to boil from a starting temperature of 18 degrees celsius assume all the energy goes into heating of the water and calculate number one the amount of energy required to boil the water for three marks the time in seconds that it takes to boil the water note that power equals energy divided by time and the time in minutes to, that takes to boil the water so let's go on these answers uh, pause the video to try yourself to do this and answers now let's go over the amber so green the energy that you need well is 1.5 the mass times the specific heat capacity of water which is 4200 
times the temperature change. Now, they only gave you the starting temperature to be 18. However, in the question, they say that you're boiling the water. So it means that the final temperature is 100. So that means that the temperature change is 100 minus 18. This would give you an answer of uh, 516,000 uh, joules, which would go for 517 if you want to do three significant figures kilojoules, okay? In another question, how long does it take? Well, I know that power equals energy over time, so time equals energy over power, so that's, um, that already can give you marks depending on the total amount of numbers, uh, of numbers of marks, but you normally get a mark for the substitution of 516 uh, 600,000 joules over 300, which is a power in kilowatts, which would give you 172 seconds and then again a mark for the seconds, okay? If you want to make that into minutes, remember that you have 2.86 minutes really if you divide 172 by, by 60. So how much is that going to be in a scale of 100? How much is that if the scale would be for 60? because we have 60 seconds maximum in a minute, right? So that would be uh, not 0.86 times 60 divided by 100. So the 60 because it's 60 seconds over 100 because you're doing the not 0.86 out of 100. That would give you 51.6. So therefore you could say that the time that it takes to boil the kettle is two minutes and 52 seconds, okay? More, oh, sorry, ignore this slide. I had put exam questions and I completely forgot to take them away. Um, storage heaters. Now, I can use materials that have a high specific heat capacity to store heat. So what is a storage heater? A storage heater uses electricity at night when it's at low demand and off peak to heat special bricks of concrete. Uh, uh, or bricks or concrete blocks in the heater and the energy transfer from the bricks keeps the room warm so whichever room that you need to have warmed up and then because the bricks have a high specific heat capacity they store a lot of energy what happens is once you're doing that they warm up slowly because the specific heat capacity is high so you need a high energy to warm them up to raise their temperature by one degree right so they warm up slowly when the heater element is on, but they also will cool down slowly when it's off. So the electricity that you consume off peak times is sometimes charged at a cheaper rate. So the storage heaters are designed to be cost effective because they are going to then during the day when the heating would be more expensive, they are going to be slowly giving off heat, so maintaining a room temperature warm. Uh, but at the same time, they did this because they have a high specific heat capacity and during the off-peak times, they were using the electricity at a cheaper rate to heat them up. So storage heaters are things that you can use to heat whatever you want and that store the heat because they have a very high specific heat capacity, okay? Uh, I'll show you another example on this, but let's just do a quiz here. So, if a material feels cold to the touch, it probably is going to be a conductor, okay? And then, which of the following won't have an effect on how fast the substance heat ups, heats up or cools down, really? So, think about the formula, specific heat capacity. The formula I use, energy equals the mass times the specific heat capacity times the time. So it's really going to be how many times you heat and cool the substance. It depends on specific heat capacity, it depends on mass, and it depends on the amount of heat that you give in. So the time is going to have um, to be dependent on B, C, and D, okay? Next one, the specific heat capacity of a substance is the energy needed or transferred to one kilogram of substance to raise its temperature by, would be one degree Celsius, okay? And then the bricks or concrete or even water, you use water in the radiators. <coughs> Sorry. They are cost effective because their specific heat capacity is high and they take a long time to heat up and cool down. The specific heat capacity is low and they take a long time to heat up and cool down. 
specific heat capacity is high and they take uh, is high and they take a short time, or specific heat capacity is low and they take a short time. The reason why they are cost effective is a. The specific heat capacity is high, they take a long time to heat up, but they also take a long time to cool down. So that's why it feels warmer even after the heating is off for a while, okay? And finally, although I told you most things or everything really that you need to know about specific heat capacity, I'm just extending it a little bit to tell you that you can think that convection and the sea breezes that you have are going to be... <coughs> explained by using specific heat capacity. So it says, the question says, it turns out that convection is not the only responsible for sea breeze. Specific heat capacity also has a, is responsible. So explain using six steps. This could be a six marker, for example. And they are telling you that the land has a lower specific heat capacity and the sea has a higher specific heat capacity. So you could think that because the sun is heating both the land and the sea at the same time, they are giving the same energy per second, right? The sea, because it's made of water and the specific heat capacity of water is really high, it has a high specific heat capacity and therefore it takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. The land has a low specific heat capacity and therefore it takes less time to heat up and then later on to cool down. So this makes that during the daytime the land is warmer than the sea. Now you know by convection that the air, uh, hot air above the land heats up, spreads apart, loses density and therefore rises. So you need to replace that air with something and you replace it with the air above the sea because that air is cold. So that air that is above the sea is cold and is down below. So it flows, as you, if you remember the lesson about convection, uh, to the top of the land, which is where it's hot. So because the air that is above the sea cools down, contracts, compacts and becomes denser and sink, that air is going to flow into where the hot air was in the land. So let me show you here on the picture. This air is going to come in and replace the warm air, uh, air that came up. And then this air, when it goes towards the sea breeze, because the sea is cooler, loses energy, gains density and sinks. And the whole cycle repeats itself on a convection current. Finally, at night, the opposite tends to happen because the convection current is going to go in the opposite direction. This is because at night, the sea, depending on the location, but the sea depends tends to be warmer than the land because the sea takes a long time to cool down, okay? So that is it about specific heat capacity. I told you what it is. I gave you some questions. I gave you some exercises where you had to apply a little bit more knowledge on other topics in science or in physics as well. So I hope it made sense and up to my next video, which will be again any sort of revision in physics. Be happy and healthy. Bye.